Uh, so you can, uh, d does everyone have Super Collider installed? Yeah, great, okay. It's not hard to find on the internet anyway. I forgot to bring my laptop, but. That's okay. <laughs> you, can, you can huddle with somebody else or, or you can just, you know, I, all the materials will be re replayable in one way or another, so. So uh, let's see. If um, what we'll do first is just kind of unpack the essentials of working in Super Collider. So what you see, and just kind of a few fundamental concepts. Um, when you open up Super Collider for the first time, you will see something that looks like this, uh, with uh, three partitioned areas. Uh, and on the left is your workspace. This is where you type and evaluate code. Um, That's where you write your programs and all that. The upper right is the help documentation. This is actually a very sort of minimal web browser. It's accessing files that are on the web. Um, uh, so you can also get to this documentation online as well. Uh, and then the bottom right is what's called the post window. This is where uh, the Super Collider interpreter will talk back to you, uh, return the results of the code that you evaluate, and print warnings and error messages if there's like something wrong with your code. Uh, let's see, other things to, um, oh, you can, you can move these around, it's rarely any, any sort of need to, but you can tuck them down in various places as you like. Uh, and you can also, you know, close them or detach them or undock them. And if you, if you lose one of them to get it back, you can go to view docklets and then post window. And then there is also this documents browser. This is just if you have like 10 files open at one time, instead of like having to tab through them all, you can just pick them from the documents panel. <clears throat> That's right. So uh, let's see, other things that are of interest is, um, the, you know, if you're on Mac OS, you can go to Super Collider Preferences. If you're on Windows, I think it's in the Edit drop-down menu, Preferences at the bottom. And things of interest here, uh, mostly in the Editor and Shortcuts section. So Editor is where you can Customize the behavior, like if you want Super Collider to automatically create uh, the, you know, when you open an enclosure like parentheses, it can automatically create the closing one for you. It's kind of a stylistic thing. It's, high, it's a workflow thing. Uh, you know, you can, there's a few other things you can play with here. Font and colors, where you have your various, uh, various sundry and sumptuous dark themes, uh, as, you know, as, as, as is very much in vogue these days. Um, I'll just stick to the stick to the default for now. Oh, and then um, uh, shortcuts. Uh, it, this is a this is a coding language. Keyboard shortcuts are your friend. Learn them, use them. You know, tuck them under your pillow at night. Uh, I think there there is a keyboard shortcut for booting the server, or I think it's Control B on Windows and Command B on Mac. I don't think there's one for quitting the server, uh, but you can you can make one. Right, it's very easy to customize these as you like. There's, there's a couple that I have added. Um, over the years for things that I, I do very frequently that there aren't shortcuts for. So lots of ways to, to customize the program. Um, right. So uh, um, it, it looks at first glance like Super Collider is just one program, and in a sense it sort of is, but if you um, kind of look underneath the surface, it's actually, it's actually three separate programs. Um, one of them is the Super Collider IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment. That's what you see here. This is like the front end for the user, which has a bunch of features like syntax colorization and auto-completion and pop-ups and things, all which are meant to just kind of improve the coding experience. So that's the, the IDE, that's what we're looking at. But then um, invisible, largely invisible to the user is the interpreter, which is the part of Super Collider that is most recognizable as a programming language. It's, 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 a, it's a program which reads and interprets and parses your code and then takes actionable, you know, uh, you know actionizes or, or whatever, the things that you do. You say, do this, and it does the thing, and it gives you the result, whether that's like a new window or some sound or something. It's the, it's the kind of the you know, processing center for all of the code. And then there's also the audio server, which is the um, sound engine. Um, and that is, um, so anytime you type and evaluate any code that is meant to play or produce or manipulate some sound, there's a bunch of secret sort of messaging that goes on underneath. And, um, you know, the language or the interpreter talks to the server. And sometimes the server talks back to the language. And so a lot of stuff is happening kind of under the hood. So uh, 
there are there are a bunch of uh, pitfalls, um, the things that you know things don't work, and it's not really totally clear immediately why they're not working. Often, it's the result of some timing issue or some miscommunication between the language and the server. Um, you know, for example, if you want to like load a sound file into memory and play it, you have to load the sound file first, and that process has to complete. Um, you know, the entire it doesn't it doesn't happen instantly. Right? It takes a few milliseconds or something. Uh, so you can write some code which attempts looks like you do this thing first and then you do the next thing, but really, the interpreter is trying to do these two things as fast as possible. And the server hasn't finished task A, and so it can't do task B. So, you know, and it's uh, things that come with experience. So. <clears throat> All right, interpreter, server, and IDE. All right, uh, SuperGlider is an object-oriented language. It's, it's actually an, it's an object-oriented language, and it's also an interpreted language. Uh, and I'm going to try not to dive, uh, we're not going to dive into like a huge sort of theoretical discussion of what it means for something to be object-oriented. Um, but it is useful to get a general sense of what that means. And uh, if an, an object-oriented language, uh, it, it's useful to, to understand what that means is to make a comparison to the real world, for example. And uh, the real world is full of things. And these things can be grouped in categories. And then items in those categories can then have subcategories of themselves. So you might imagine, uh, for example, like... Uh, you know the the sort of the category in which everything is contained would be called like things. This is the sort of top level or root level object, right? And then within this category of things, we might have uh, many sub things like uh, vehicles, buildings, um, organisms. And many, many more things. Right? So, just kind of next level down, uh, in vehicles we might have cars, bikes, right? organisms. We might have, I don't know, mammals. And then somewhere in here we'd have humans. Right. So this is kind of like the tree of things. And SuperCollider, being an object-oriented language, is structured in the same way. It's full of these objects, uh, classes of objects. And uh, you know every object, uh, except for the one at the very top level, which is called object, has um, a parent class or a superclass. It's sort of the, the thing that, that is immediately above it on the tree. And many objects also have subclasses. So um, this is kind of the, the structure of things. So we'll, we'll work, there's lots of classes in SuperCollider, like integers, booleans, unit generators, windows, buttons, array, it just it goes on and on. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of, of classes in SuperCollider. So, uh, and so uh, uh, a consequence of this is that, um, well, uh, the idea of um, methods and inheritance is something that, that's kind of important to acknowledge here, um, where uh, a, a method in the context of a programming language is uh, an instruction or a, a sort of, um, let's see, what do, what do I call it? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a query or something like that. And uh, some methods make sense for some objects and not for other objects. Like the message uh, squared is meaningful for a number. Like square the, follow, square the number four, square the number negative 17, right? That's, that's fine, but if you have like a graphical slider and you say squared to that thing, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you could arbitrarily define some reaction for that object to have in response, but I think it's pretty reasonable to say that that's a nonsense operation. Um, and then there are other methods, like play, for instance, is one that is defined for many, many objects. It's defined for functions, it's defined for routines, it's, lots of objects can be played in SuperCollider. And it doesn't always do the same thing. Um, so, you know, when you play this object and you play that object, different things will happen. And a good example of that in the real world is the verb to file. If I give you a piece of paper and I say file this, you, you know oh, i got to put this in a drawer in the right folder. But if I give you a piece of metal and say file this, you don't do the same thing. You get a, a file and you start shaving down the metal, right? So it's, 
um, th this, is, this is an example of something called uh, polymorphism, where the same method given to different objects can have different results. Um, so that's, that's the idea of methods. And inheritance is the idea of uh, if a method is defined for an object, like organisms, or actually, let's, let's, let's define a method for things, which is the query, are you alive? Right? This is a meaningful operation for anything. Right? You can say, is the, like when you're playing 20 questions, is it alive? Right? And if you pass that method to a vehicle, the response will be no. Or a building, the response is no. But for an organism, the answer is yes. And you know, when, when, um, when a method is defined for an object, uh, all of its subclasses and its subclasses inherit that method. And uh, so they will respond to it. And uh, in some cases, they might respond differently. But generally speaking, if you can use a method with an object, you can use that method with all of its subclasses as well. I realize this is it's a little bit theoretical, so we'll kind of accelerate through this a little bit. In fact, why don't we um, uh, put this away and uh, uh, write, write some code. So I'm going to enlarge my font a little bit. <clears throat> so let's, let's do a very simple example of, uh, let's, you know, let's write our first extremely short program. And let's pass the method squared to the number four. The way we do that syntactically, there's actually a couple different stylistic ways we can do it. But I think the way which is most common is to say four, and then a period, and then squared, with a semicolon at the end. So this is a what we call a single expression or a line of code. And what it means is um, the, the, the thing dot thing is uh, four is said to be the receiver of the method squared. So it's receiver dot method. Um, okay, how do, we, how do we action this? Right? The way we do it, if we're dealing with just a single line of code, something which is unbroken by any return characters, is you hold shift and you push enter. And it'll flash, and uh, in the post window you should see the number 16. I think this is probably the most common structure for this kind of expression, but you will also see squared four. This is also um, an option. So this is the same, same expression, but structured differently. And then uh, I think there's even, even other options here, but these I think are the are the two most common. And you know how, how you you can write it in either way. It kind of depends on your personal preference. I, for this case, I, I like um, uh, this one because it it mimics how the phrase would be spoken in English. When, whenever you have the option to write code that is readable as if it were in normal everyday language, I think you should go for that. Um, this, is, this is four squared. Right? Um, and then I think there are there are other examples where you might opt for uh, an alternative, like um, uh, it, if if we're inside of a, a an object called a routine, which is like a function where you can express timings, where you can say do this, then wait for this many seconds, then do this. Um, you know the the expression you you could do four dot wait, or you could do wait for, and this might be an example of something where you might favor something like this because it says wait for four seconds or four beats or whatever. Um, uh, but, you know, it's tomato, tomato. And um, once, once we write this expression, we can think about uh, four squared as being uh, equivalent to the number 16. So, you know, we, I mean, you know, we know what four squared is. We could have just written 16. Uh, but uh, the, the point I want to make here is that once you construct a, an expression of code, you can then chain additional methods onto it. Like, for example, uh, dot neg, which is a, a method which will take its receiver and flip the sign. So positive becomes negative, negative becomes positive. So what happens here is we, we run this line, we get negative 16. Um, and order does matter here. Uh, the thing that happens first is, well, when you, when you have an expression which is just thing dot thing dot thing dot thing, uh, it just goes left to right. 
So four squared happens first, and then the neg is applied to the receiver, which is, you know, we might as well write it like this, because this is sort of what SuperCollider sees. It, it, um, it does this thing first, and then, then the next thing. So if we did it the other way around, then we would take the negative of 4 and then square it, and that, of course, gives us positive 16. <coughs> and you can combine these in various ways. You might do something like this. Right? So uh, in this case, uh, we don't go left to right. Uh, anything in parentheses will happen first. And then, then this method would be applied. And so the, you, know, you could also write this as, uh, let's see, the four dot neg. Right? So just kind of combining these two, you know, this. Really, I'm just, I'm just doing this to kind of prep you for code that you might see and just be able to understand structurally what's, what's happening here. So I need to remember to not delete stuff because this is going to be a code file to share with you later. So if I just keep deleting this and overwriting it, it's not going to be very useful to you. OK. Uh, something like uh, 4 squared doesn't need any additional information. Squared is, squared is not a, a, a query that requires additional components. Right? It just says square it. But something like uh, pow, which is to the power of, needs what's called another argument. So if we just say for pet.pow, we get our first error message. And this is, uh, you know, you see one of these when you're using SuperCollider, it can be very daunting because it, it's completely like, it, I mean, it, you get a little bit of information. It says error, binary operator, pow, failed, receiver, nil, et cetera, et cetera, alien language. Um, and what this, what this says is, um, you know, to translate this to English, a supercollider has just said, you've asked me to give you four to the power of. That's not meaningful, right? So we need to say four to the power of what? Um, so we can say four to the power of three. And there's it's 64. Uh, so some methods need additional information, um, but some don't. All right, um, let's, let's say um, we want to do several things, right? We want to write a program, and one expression is just not enough. We need it to do more things, so we've got to write a bigger program. So we might, uh, let's, let's just, um, uh, you know, let's say we want to, we want to have some, some value, like initialize it, and then do some math, and then do some more math, and then give us the result. Like, let's, let's break this up into multiple statements, because... Uh, if we wanted to square a number and then take the negative and then, I don't know, subtract one and then do this and do that, it, we could do all that in one line, but it just is this run-on line that's going to, like, bleed over to the next line, and it's just going to be very difficult to... It's like a, you know, be sort of like um, reading a book with no punctuation. It's like, you can sort of read it, but it's really annoying, right? You, um, oh, and, and speaking of punctuation, this semicolon is what's called the statement terminator. It tells SuperCollider this is the end of this expression, and the next thing is going to be part of a new expression. And if you don't do semicolons and you're dealing with multiple lines, you're going to get error messages. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so um, let's say uh, x equals 4, and then we'll say x equals x dot squared, and then we'll say x equals x dot neg, and then return x. Right? So x is what we call a variable. It's a named container that we can use to just store information there. Just, so this, this equals, uh, in, in sort of grade school math, this means uh, these two quantities are equal. But in programming, it's an assignment. It says this container will contain, or is, is uh, being assigned, this value. So after this expression, x contains the value 4. Then we say, OK, that container, I want you to overwrite it with the value of whatever it contains squared, and then overwrite it with whatever it contains uh, made negative. And then this last statement is just sort of, um, there, there are some programming languages where you'll have some sort of thing like return x, or some, some phrase or, or some delimiter which says this is the actual result. Um, with SuperCollider, uh, when you have a multi-line chunk of code, 
the last expression, the value of the last expression is automatically the thing that is returned. Um, so if we go up here and we, um, you know, we could run this, you know, but okay, it's just the first line, and oh, now we have to do this, and now we have to do this, and now we have to do this, and, and you know, so we don't want to have to like manually step through a, a set of expressions. We want to just run it all at once. And to do that, we enclose uh, the code that we want to encapsulate in this singular block with parentheses, uh, one on the line above, one on the line below. And so this creates an enclosure which uh, SuperCollider will interpret as a, a sort of one piece of multiple lines to evaluate. So if we, now to actually run this, we just got to make sure that the cursor is somewhere in or on, really anywhere inside or on one of the parentheses, as long as it's, you know, the cursor is somewhere on that block. Uh, if you're on Mac OS, it's Command Enter, and in Windows, it's Control Enter. And so you should see the whole block flash, and uh, SuperCollider does the whole thing. In fact, let's actually clear the post window. So you can right click on the post window and hit clear. I think the keyboard shortcut is Shift Command P or Shift Control P. Always a good thing to do if you just want to, you know, if you if you got a bunch of error messages and you want to figure out what it is, a good thing to do is clear the post window first and then run the code again to really see what's going on. So you can run this and the result is negative 16, okay? Um, so X is not a particularly meaningful name. It's just X. I mean, it, when, when possible, we generally want to make variable names be, uh, as they say, self-documenting. So you know, we want to give this, a, and we're doing a very abstract example. So, uh, but let's, let's say uh, we'll just call this um, val, for, short for value. I think there's a, there's a nice balance to be struck between um, clarity and brevity where you know you you don't need to say like my value or something like that you can just say val right but you don't want to do v because that's a little too short so it's it again stylistic um, uh, so here here we'll try to run this again and we get an error message that says uh, variable val not defined okay what does this mean uh, the single lowercase alphabetic characters are sort of an exception to this rule. They are what are called interpreter variables. They are free for us to use for any purpose and we don't have to declare or tell SuperCollider ahead of time, hey, I want to use this container. But if it's anything more than a single lowercase character, um, we have to declare that variable first. And we do that by saying var space and then the um, name of the variable we want to declare. So this will work fine because we've told SuperCollider, hey, for the code I'm about to run, just set aside this container called val, and then we're able to use it. Um, of course, once we're done, uh, val is gone. It was a transient thing. It got the job done, and we got the result we wanted, but, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a transient variable. So uh, if you want to declare a variable that is uh, more durable, one option is to use the single lowercase character, or you can proceed. Uh, you don't need a declaration statement, and you proceed the variable name with a tilde. And in doing so, so uh, we can we can just evaluate val by itself, and it has a value of what's called nil. This is the value given to things that don't yet have a value. I mean, this is, the alternative would be some sort of error message or crash or something. So nil is the value of things that don't have a value. So then if we run this code, um, you know, SuperCollider, uh, the interpreter parses these lines and returns the last value, which is negative 16. And now tilde val is, retains that value, and so we can, we're free to use this wherever we like. Um, this, so this uh, x is called an interpreter variable. This tilde val is called an environment variable. We could, you know, at some point maybe we'll get into the specifics of what it actually means for something to be an environment variable, but for now it's fine to just understand this as environment variables having global scope. So they, they will even uh, persist uh, across um, other tabs. Right? So this, we're in another tab now and it's still got the same value. So as long as the interpreter remains active, 
um, val will retain its value until we overwrite it with something, and then it's going to retain that value. All right, so the common problems I see, uh, like people online, things like that, like, hey, I did your code exactly, and it doesn't work. 90% of the time, it's because they're using the wrong keyboard shortcut to evaluate it. Um, so uh, the, the general rules here are is if any code is highlighted, um, like if I, if I have like just the QU highlighted here or something, it doesn't matter if I push shift enter or command enter, it's going to try to evaluate the highlighted code. We, so it, it's almost like SuperCollider has like blinders on and it does not see anything else. It only sees the highlighted code. So it thinks that I'm trying to use an undeclared variable. So for if, if you're just not paying attention and you have something highlighted, you're like, man, this is just not working today. Um, you know, you, so that's, you can highlight, this, this is nice. I mean, it's nice to be able to highlight something and just run that bit of your code. In fact, this is, this is a, a consequence of SuperCollider being an interpreted language uh, compared to a compiled language. In a compiled language, you write your entire program up front and then you compile and run. And so the, the, the interpreter will process everything and then do the result. An interpreted language, is a more dynamic and interactive affair where we can do sort of, we can just evaluate line by line, character by character, spontaneously. This is really nice because we're dealing with an audio language here, and so we're doing any sort of live performance or live coding or anything. It's very desirable to be able to interact with the code in real time as it's happening. So, but um, if nothing is highlighted and you push Shift Enter, SuperCollider will just try to run the current line. And depending on what's on that line, you might get all sorts of error messages. Um, uh, yes, if, uh, right, and so, so if no, co no code is highlighted, uh, shift enter will do the current line, command enter will do the entire block if you are inside of a block like this. But uh, for example, down here, we're not inside of a multi-line block, so either shift enter or command enter will run that single expression. So if something's not working, the first thing to check is, did I do the right keyboard shortcut? Because that can, that can cause all sorts of problems, and it can send you down a rabbit hole of like you know, looking at your code for mis mistyped things. It can often be very simple. <clears throat> OK. Moving right along here. Uh, OK, so let's talk about uh, comments real quick. A comment is a, a, a concept which is sort of ubiquitous in every programming language. It's a way for us to write notes to ourselves and other human readers, which will be completely invisible to the interpreter. So for example, there's basically two styles here. There's multi-line comments. Uh, multi-line comment uh, starts with a forward slash asterisk and ends with a asterisk forward slash. And in between this, uh, these uh, enclosures, or in, in this enclosure, we can type uh, anything. Right. And uh, we can you know, put this on multiple lines, right? all sorts of white space. And uh, just basically, as soon as SuperCollider sees this, it says, oh, I'm not looking. Right? And it's just going to look away until it encounters this and says, OK, now I'm paying attention again. So this is, if you have a big, long paragraph or something, multi-line comment is good. Um, and if you want to do a single line comment, so basically a comment that's not going to have a return character in it, uh, that's just a double forward slash. And then you um, type whatever you want here. And as soon as you push return, then we're back in. Uh, you know, we're not in gray anymore, so it's, it's regular stuff. So sometimes you might want to put a single comment at the end of a, an expression. Sometimes you might want to put an introductory thing at the top here. These are the two styles. Okay, um, I think I mentioned white space is just like extra space characters and return characters. Super Collider is, um, on the whole, indifferent to white space. For example, you, you notice that, um, let's, uh, let's do, a, do another expression here. Let's say um, uh, 3 plus 4 squared um, uh, k equals 3 plus 4 squared. So <clears throat> uh, 
uh, I, I'm in the ha I have certain habits with my white space. Whenever I am dealing with a symbolic operator, like plus, minus, multiplication, division, uh, or uh, assignments, or things like that, I, I'll put white space uh, I, um, like this. But I don't do the same thing with methods. Uh, it's all stylistic. Like I can get rid of these and do this. And this is actually still completely valid. It just looks pretty weird. So um, generally speaking, you know, there's some exceptions to this rule. But uh, generally speaking, Supercloud doesn't really care uh, about how you stylize your code with white space. Um, you know, I mean, I do have some suggestions. And I do try to be consistent with what I do. Um, the, I think, again, there's kind of a balance to be struck where uh, if you try to make your code as compact as possible and like don't do any spaced characters, I think it it just it's like uh, it feels like a messy room. It's just like a little cluttered. It's a little cramped. It's a little claustrophobic. It just doesn't look as nice, you know. Uh, but you, I mean, you know, you can also go too far in the other direction where it's like, whoa, that's a lot of white space. Do we, you know, let's. So it's it's just personal preference ultimately. But uh, generally, you won't encounter too many problems um, with white space. Uh, oh, and, and then um, just wh while we're here, uh, let's talk about uh, order of operations. So you might remember from grade school that multiplication and division happens before addition and subtraction. So uh, just looking at this, you would probably guess that this is going to be 4 times 7, which is 28, plus 3, which is 31. But it's not. It's 49. Bi these are called binary operators. These are symbols which apply some operation involving two quantities. And I, um, yeah, it, the, it just goes left to right. So 3 plus 4 happens first, and then times 7. And, I, and if this makes you roll your eyes, you're totally justified in feeling that way. That's a fine way to feel. Judgmental. Yeah, right, if you want to be a little judgmental. I, I, would, I completely understand it's... Um, so uh, if, if you want something to happen first, you put it in parentheses like this. Right? So parentheses will happen first, and then binary operators. Uh, so this, this will give us the, the value if, if we do 4 times 7 first, right? as opposed to this one. Um, and then also uh, methods. In fact, let me, let me do an example, see if I can hunt down an example from my book. Let's see, it's somewhere around here. Ah, okay. Uh, so let's let me go through these. This is like a little code example here. So four plus two times three. If we're only dealing with basic symbolic binary operators, it just happens. Uh, left to right. So 4 plus 2 is 6, times 3 is 18. Parentheses, we have just seen, uh, take precedence over the left to right binary operations. So in this case, we get 10. Um, something like this. And so here we have uh, a receiver.method construction and a binary operator. In this case, the methods take preference precedence. So this will happen first and then the plus 4. So we'll get 2 to the power of 3 plus 4. How would we make 4 plus 2 happen first? Right. We put it in parentheses, right? So the parentheses will overtrump. Parentheses have precedence over the receiver.method construct. Right. Yeah. So the, the general rule is parentheses happen first, then methods then binary operators left to right. So and like I think the example of that I have here is right. So in this case, the first thing that happens is parentheses, four plus two. And you know, also these parentheses happen first, but there's really nothing to do in here. It's just the number three. So we have uh, six to the power of 3, because methods happen next. And then finally, we add 1. So this is 6 to the 3, which is 216, plus 1, which is 217. Right? Another area where confusion can often happen, and you're just not, you know, if you're not expecting it, it can be a real surprise. Um, OK. 
I've been throwing a lot of methods at you, squared, neg, pow. How do I know these? Am I just coming up with them off the top of my head? Where do they come from? So let's talk about the help browser. Um, and you, it's good to keep in mind the help browser is not written to be a tutorial. It's written to be reference files and documentation. So there isn't really a sort of logical teaching path through the help documentation. But if you see some code and you say, oh, squared, what does that do? And you want to look it up, you just put the cursor on the method you want to, you don't have to highlight it or anything, just put the cursor there and then Mac OS, Command D, Windows, Control D, and uh, this will look up um, help files for classes which respond to this method. So there's a whole bunch here, abstract function, complex, matrix, etc. cetera. Uh, and so you might think, okay, well, where's integer? Well, okay, it's, it's not here. It probably should be here, but simple number is the superclass. Oh, it even, it even jumps to the method, which is nice. So it tells you the square of the number. Right? It's kind of self-documenting, but there are others where you're like, well, what the heck does this do? So uh, anyway, let's see if I can get to the top here. Uh, yeah, so you can also see a little bit of hierarchy here. Uh, object is the parent class of all classes. The immediate subclass is magnitude, and then number, and then simple number. Um, and then uh, underneath simple number, you can see we have subclasses float and integer. So integer are whole numbers, numbers that don't have a decimal point. Uh, floats are numbers that do have a decimal point. In fact, we can introduce another method here. If we say for.class, uh, it returns the class to which that object belongs. For point zero, even though it's uh, mathematically equivalent, is actually a different class. It's a float because it's got a period in there. Right? Uh, there are a lot of methods that uh, are defined for simple number and therefore work on floats and integers, but there are some that only work on floats or integers. Uh, one of them being is prime, I think. For is prime, this will, uh, there's a lot of methods that start with is, and they often return, always, I guess, return Booleans. A Boolean is true or false. So for is not prime, so this expression returns false. If we say 4.0 is prime, it doesn't like that. Right? We're not allowed to ask if floating point numbers are prime. <laughs> it says, I don't know, I don't get it. Um, uh, anyway, so that's the, the help browser. You, you can look up um, a methods this way uh, if, if, you are, if you see the name of a class. Uh, classes always start with a capital letter, and by default in the default colorization, they turn blue. You can also look these up, and this command D or control D will take you directly to the help file for that class. And the general structure of, uh, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a different uh, class here because I don't know if integer is a good example for this but uh, also I'll, if you push shift command D that'll bring up a little search bar so you can search for a class I'm going to look at routine which is a, another class you can see its hierarchy its subclasses gives you a most help files start with a brief description of you know, some pros which tells you kind of what this is and why it's useful and then we go into class methods Class methods are the ones which are meant to be applied directly to the class. Right? It's a method, a, a method, method that we send to the class itself. We're talking to the class of objects. Um, and then there are instance methods, which are intended to be applied to instances of that class. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a second. So, various methods, class methods, instance methods, and then often uh, we're still in the methods here. There will be uh, a lot of methods here. Mm -hmm. Examples. Right? So then we see examples of what this actually looks like in some code examples. Uh, and so these, you can actually run these um, right here in the, in the help browser as if it were code, which is nice. You can also just copy and paste them over here if you like that better. Right? So this thing is just gonna, gonna count away. <coughs> And uh, that's basically it. So the name, the hierarchy, subclasses, the description, class and instance methods, and then some examples. Not all the help files will have this structure, but a lot of them do. So it's good to get uh, comfortable with it. Uh, there's also, let's see, uh, 
the class browser. This is, um, I, I, I think this, the help files are the most useful, but you can also say something like uh, integer dot browse. And this will open the class browser. And this is just like a sort of um, navigable interface for climbing up and down the class tree. Uh, I don't think I can really make this bigger. I, I'm gonna, I can zoom in like this, but I don't know if QuickTime actually captures this. So, um, you know, on the, on the rewatch, this might be the same size, but uh, you, can, you can look at the super class, right? So that takes us one level up. And then we can, uh, you know, down here in the bottom left are the subclasses, and we can double click on one of those to go back down. We see the various methods that are valid for this class. Uh, we can also open the help file, right? So integer help file opens up over here. And, and also these are, these are like forward and back buttons, so you can kind of, it remembers your browsing history. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that this is like more helpful than the help files, it's just, just another option. And uh, if you really wanna, um, you know, uh, let's, let's say, let's just, let's just make a, a fun, an empty function and say dot play. And you know, you, we can do command D to look up you know, various things that play is implemented for. And if you do uh, command I, you will look, you can look up um, actual files in the super collider source code for which it's defined. So we can go to like event play and it opens up the file and you can actually see the code that's actually executed when you play an event. And again, I, this is, I'm not encouraging you to dive deep in here because I, it's, if, it's, if you're sort of new-ish to super collider, this is not immediately a useful thing to do, but it's good to know where to look for the source code just in case you want to actually see what's going on under the hood. So that's called looking up implementations. <coughs> command I, yeah. And, and similar, shift command I will give you a search bar just so you can say play and enter and then it'll look up things like that. Um, so it sometimes takes a little bit of uh, hunting around. You know, if you're looking, like if you're doing some project or homework assignment and you're like, I want a method that just, you know, orders a bunch of things like put you know if I have a um, let's say we have a I don't know an array like two seven five nine right we'll say x equals this array um, right so and then we want to like sort the item so you can say okay well, maybe it's like uh, put in order I'm like oh that wasn't it right so you, you know is it order right that's a different thing that's not what we wanted uh, it, it happens to be sort. Um, but the thing to do is, is you say you recognize that we're working with an array, which is an ordered collection delineated with square brackets. And uh, um, so we can look up the help file for array. And, you know, you can sort of make your way down here. But it, it can be kind of frustrating because, uh, let's see, is, is sort actually defined here? But what I'm doing here is... Uh, Command F and then typing sort and then you just keep pushing enter and it will cycle through instances. So, so the method is actually not here. It's being used, but it would have found it here. So this is a, a case where maybe maybe you would go up to arrayed collection, which is its superclass, and look for sort here. And or okay, it's not there. Maybe it's sequenceable collection. There it is. Right. But of course, if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what to search for. So. Um, uh, it's it's the kind of thing where I, I I liken learning super collider to like learning a foreign language where you don't just like grab a dictionary and start memorizing every single word in the dictionary, you talk to somebody, right? You look at some code, maybe you write some code, you watch some videos, you take a class, and then you you start being able to put together basic sentences and express yourself, and you just will end up learning the methods that are most useful to you to so that you can get the job done. Um, so I mean there are. I, I guarantee you, I, there's probably like 80% of the methods in SuperCollider I don't know and have never used because there's just so many. Um, it's just there's really only a couple of them are, that are like essential and, and really useful. Yeah. All right. Uh, since I'm going to make this book available, this chapter available, I'm not going to have to do all of this stuff. But uh, let's let, let me briefly do kind of a a tour of uh, some classes and methods here. So we've already seen integers and floats. You know what those are. Um, 
so there's also a class called string. A string is an ordered collection of characters, and it is delineated with an enclosure of double quotes. Like this, right? And we can do things with it like scramble, where it'll just kind of randomize the order of the characters. Uh, X dot reverse will reverse the string. Uh, X dot keep seven will just only keep the first seven characters. Uh, so there's lots of, you know, it's, it's an ordered collection. You can kind of slice it up and do all sorts of weird things with it. Generally speaking, strings in SuperCollider are used for giving things names. Right? And, uh, if, you, if you make a, a window and whatever you want to put in the title bar, you use a string for that. Um, there is also the class uh, symbol. And there's two ways to delineate a symbol. One of them is with, uh, actually, you know what? We, we're gonna, it's gonna be tricky because it's single quotes. I think this is a valid symbol. Right? So again, it's a lot like um, a string, although generally you don't do sort of long sentences with, with uh, symbols. You might do just, just a, a single sort of phrase or something. So this is one way, and uh, the other way is with a, backslash at the beginning. Um, the uh, strings have a size. So there's 19 characters in the string. But in the symbol hello, uh, all symbols have size 0. It's, you, you should think of symbols as being a lot like numbers, in that like the number 4. Right? It doesn't really have a size, even though it's a number. It's just, you know, it's not a, it's not a collection of things. It's just one singular thing, and, there's a, and they're unique. Um, so symbols are sort of similar in that, you know, the symbol hello is just a, a singular unit. You can go back and forth. So this, this takes uh, x, which is a symbol, converts it to a string, and now we can see it is actually a class, so we could say size. Right? And you can use as symbol to convert a string to a symbol. In SuperCollider, strings and symbols are 90% of the time interchangeable. I think symbols tend to be a little bit faster in terms of like a compilation time or something like that. But generally, they're both used for naming things, and they're very similar. Um, we've seen uh, Booleans a little bit when we said for dot is prime. So this expression returns a Boolean. There are exactly two Boolean values, true and false. And they are actually one of a handful of characters which are special characters that can be used without declaration. Also, you can't name a variable true right, or false. So true and false, right? these are just sort of values. Uh, nil is another example of a, a keyword that is sort of reserved for special use. Uh, so expressions like this will return booleans, right? Two greater than one. Uh, if you want to say, let's say, is, is one greater than one? No, that's not true. But is one greater than or equal to one? Yes, it is. So, you know, this, this is how we do the uh, symbolic representation of greater than or equal to. Uh, what if we want to say, is one equal to one? We can't do this, right? This is like assign the number one to the number, no, it doesn't make any sense. Double equals is the equality check. And exclamation point equals is the check for inequality. So is one not equal to one? That is false. So, yeah, a lot of Boolean cartwheelery going on here. So um, uh, I, I sometimes see people use the classes true and false. And in fact, this might actually work if you use the classes instead of the actual instances of the class. But I don't recommend this. You should always use um, the actual instances, the lowercase versions. OK, I see we're out of time. Sorry, gone over a little bit. A uh, couple more things to cover. I, I had a feeling this would be a, a sort of two-week introduction. On uh, Next week, we'll talk about uh, is it functions. Uh, eh. It's going to be a lot easier when these pages are not just all loose. 
uh, yeah, functions, randomness, conditional logic, and iteration. It's sort of more, a little bit more higher level fundamental concepts. And I'll, I'll probably put the first homework assignment online, um, and it'll be due in two weeks because we still got some more stuff to cover. But anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, you're welcome to stick around if you have any questions or things like that. And uh, we'll see you next week.